Coming up on TPI, we're on location in Washington, D.C. We'll be meeting the first ever Miss Africa Union in Diaspora. Her beauty is undeniable, but what's more important about her is the impact that she's making on this world that we live in. And a woman tries to find guidance from the spirit of her ancestors, but she found herself tormented. My, it's a fascinating story. All this and much more for you, coming up right now on TPI. Hello, I'm Muiwa. Thank you for joining us. I'm on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., here in the United States of America. The studio we normally will record in is only three hours away. But this is the first time ever that we will record right here. So you're a part of TPI history. First up, did you know slavery still exists? Sex trafficking is a worldwide business. And the man in our first story is on a mission to bring it to an end. Take a look. This is the fastest growing criminal enterprise on the planet. Uh, we work with law enforcement. We go undercover in this dark, dark world of child sex trafficking. It's a very difficult thing to recruit uh, people into this cause because it's so heavy. In a rare gesture, out came the heavy lifters. Tim Ballard, founder of Operation Underground Railroad, got some help when Pittsburgh Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin volunteered his NFL team to raise awareness for Tim's agency. All you have to do is be exposed to what Tim and company are doing at OUR, um, how significant the work is, how, how much needed the work is. I spent some time praying about it and thinking about it, but just thought it was worth our time to bring OUR out here and spend a couple days with us as a football team. God would take a hold of that. The relationship has grown. So has the profile of the four-year nonprofit. As a retired government agent, Tim formed a task force from among the best operatives. When Mike Tomlin came out and announced his, his partnership with us, it, he doesn't even realize how powerful that was to our team. Like that's important psychologically for my guys to have that. It's been a healing for us. The Steelers are huge. There's a, it's, a, it's a, an enormous fan base and child sex slavery. This is something that's so dark that you need people of light to say, it's okay to look at it. And people like Mike Tomlin and, and, and the Steelers organization can't think of a better partner. What makes Operation Underground Railroad unique? Our team is made up of, of specialists in rescue operations. Former Navy SEALs, former Special Ops, former CIA, former federal law enforcement. Guys who had a specialty in all of this. And then aftercare specialists who are gonna go in and make sure these kids have the healing they need. So, and, and we partner with those same agencies that we all retired from. We go right into the belly of it, child trafficking with the solution and liberate these kids. Would we be surprised to understand who these perpetrators are? The world would be shocked if they knew who these people were. I mean, two million children forced into the commercial sex trade. What kind of demand justifies that number? These are people of all walks of life. I've, I've arrested all of them. They're educators, they're, they're professionals, doctors, lawyers. This is sex addiction that, that drives this. Anybody is exposed to that evil if they let themselves go there. What drives you in this? My kids. I have seven children and whatever kid we're looking for out there in the world, when I look into that victim's eyes, I see my child's eyes. This is called empathy. Empathy, we should be praying for empathy. When God sees that you are willing to have empathy, even though it hurts a little bit, oh, he's there. He sends his power and you feel it. And there's almost this triangulation between yourself, that child victim, and the Lord. Does salvation and deliverance look different to you from the eyes of those kids? Oh, absolutely. At some of the brightest moments I've had moments of light have been in those dark places. It, it took me some time to realize what that was. It's the Spirit of God. And deliverance, the way we th think of it, it, it's more than just spiritual. I mean, it is physical. The Lord cares about that physical deliverance because the physical deliverance leads to the spiritual deliverance. You know, that's, what, that's why God cares about people in captivity, nations in captivity. Hey, Tim, that your hand? That's my hand. And the child? 
That's a child that we rescued. Uh, this is the pivotal moment. This is the connection. Mm. This is the part where we reassure mm. there is hope for your future. We're not going anywhere. Mm. We pulled you out of this, but we are staying with you until you become a survivor and a thriver in this world. Ops are ready. SWAT team's ready. What's the last thing you do before you go in? We always, always kneel in prayer. We have a Messianic Jew, a former Navy SEAL, who just two weeks ago gave this amazing prayer in Hebrew. God, we know these kids are out there. When we get there, lead us to them. And this child, I mean, later came to us and she said, how did you find me? There was no hope. I know the answer is because God led us to you. We pray to find that one child who's in that dark corner of the most obscure nation on the planet. What has to be done to eliminate it? We believe that the enforcement of anti-trafficking laws will lead to the end of this. We've got to keep hitting it. It's this deterrent effect. Their captors are gone because the travelers, the sex tourists, are now afraid to tour. The traffickers are now afraid to traffic. That's how you shut it down. Well, why do people want this? It's pornography. It starts with pornography. It, it starts with, with an, an addiction that can't be met. It's about bringing you know, the principles of, of Christ's gospel to the world and, and letting that cleanse our society. Does it extend for you to have the capability of forgiving, even praying for those that you arrest? It does. It does. I mean, the, the, the grace of God is that powerful. And in that moment, you just want that person locked up because they don't, they've lost the privilege of participating in society. Then you do recognize that in some strange, almost incomprehensible way, they have become victimized by darkness through the decisions they've made. And there is redemption for everybody. And so you do pray for that. I mean, we're, we're commanded to pray for that. We have to pray for that um, as part of the, the overall solution. God is the cause of liberty. All of us can do our bit to end sex trafficking. Please don't stand idly by while lives are being lost and destroyed daily around the world. Martin Luther King Jr. is quoted as saying, all that needs to happen for evil to succeed is that good men stay silent. Do not stay silent. The young lady you're about to meet certainly is not staying silent. She's doing her best to fight the evils of our world. Her qualifications are way too long for me to list, but her face will remind you of a certain royal from the United Kingdom. Please welcome to TPI, Queen Laquissa Morin. Good to meet you, Your Majesty. Lovely to meet you. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> now, you were crowned the first ever Miss Africa Union in Washington, D.C. For those who are not familiar, what's that about? So the first uh, ever Miss African Union pageant was held uh, mm -hmm. December 7th, 2018. And the goal was to encourage youth participation in the ongoing uh, discourse and initiatives on um, African development. And so for youth, um, youth consists primarily a huge portion of the population yes. on the African continent. And there's a big disconnect between leadership with the elders and the older generation yes. and then youth and the younger generation. So we wanted to bridge that gap. I don't mean to be offensive, but I mean, what do you young people, all you know about is Snapchat <laughs> and especially a beauty queen. What do you know about development in Africa? So I did work for the World Bank in 2016 um, on environmental consult as an environmental consultant um, on environmental initiatives, uh, disaster risk management. Um, so for me, um, I, I can speak for myself when I say that that was a very eye-opening experience mm -hmm. um, to realizing that not only are these hard issues um, affecting so many African countries, but yeah. that the people don't have um, a way to mitigate the disaster effects. So they're impacted by it and they have no recourse. Um, like, like here in the States, we okay. have um, food shelters or programs that help to um, mitigate the damage. Mm -hmm. But um, in a lot of African countries, I feel that a lot of youth are affected by these issues as well. But they feel that they don't have a voice to really um, participate in the agency of change or uh, parliament or um, they feel unheard. Um, so that was a big issue that a lot of the youth uh, described to me um, as Miss African Union and ways for their voices to be heard. Now, you yourself, just to be clear, you're, you're African. You have some Zambian in you. You, you. you were born in Togo. Yes. Your 
one of your parents is Zambia, one is French. Yes. You've lived in different parts of the world. Yes. Uh, but I know you, you work hard to fight some of these issues. Uh, what would you say is uh, the one that you're most passionate about? Uh, is it literacy? Is it women? Uh, and, and why? It's a great question. So I would say that the one I'm most passionate about, um, I feel it's at the base of all of these other issues with health, education, inequality, is, is the economy. Because you can't really fund health, you can't really fund education, you can't really um, fight to promote equality without the funds to do so mm -hmm. and the access to those resources. Um, so right now I'm trying to um, create a framework for socioeconomic development initiatives um, with partnering with different organizations, um, different UN uh, organizations, as well as um, with global embassies to basically um, participate in investment forums. Forgive me. That can encourage these, African startups. These organizations you talk about have been at it for decades. Right. Uh, what's going to change this, this time around uh, uh, for our generation or for your generation being a young African, um, because you see, uh, you hear of these initiatives, yet you see constantly uh, uh, leaders and people taking resources out of Africa and putting it in Switzerland and putting right. it in the Seychelles. What is going to change with what you're, in, you're, you're working towards? So the biggest difference with my approach to it is that there's going to be now a sustainability factor. So uh, the biggest issue economically, again, is the lack of intra-African trade. So you have a lot of aid going into Africa mm. and, and the resources are being used, but there's no foundation that sustains that. There's no recycling process. Um, it, it's like if you're investing in a business, right? You're expecting returns. It's going to be a circular process. So that's what's lacking. Okay, so if the, the money economy. goes into Africa, uh, you're, you're saying for Nigeria no, it to, to do... No, start from Africa as opposed okay. to being... Coming um, into Africa. Coming into Africa. So for Nigeria to trade with Ghana, for exactly. Ghana to trade with Togo. For Togo. Africans to work with other Africans to solve African problems. Okay. Now, the enormity of the, of the problem can't be denied. And I know many people who are uh, much older, some statesmen, some who've worked in charities, who've become totally exasperated by the problems of Africa. Uh, how does your faith in God and your faith in Christ strengthen you to be able to face this giant that we're dealing with? My faith would be at the base of all of this. Um, it's what keeps me hopeful and believing that as a team, as a group of people, people who, are, who have been infected by these issues, people who have suffered at the hands of these issues time, time and time again, generation after generation, um, it's, now, it's now enough. I feel that a lot of youth, a lot of uh, adults, a lot of uh, elders, they're tired of seeing these issues and nothing being done about these issues. Mm -hmm. And so the change is in the mindset. It needs to happen with the mindset. And my faith with God is believing that this can, this can be delivered. Mm -hmm. Nothing is impossible with that faith. And so um, with the African startups, youth now participating in African-owned businesses, keeping it within the continent so mm -hmm. that it can develop and grow as opposed to reaching out for help. You don't right. need that assistance. We can work within and grow from within the continent. And I think that's the goal is changing the mindset. I with love that, that phrase, faith. nothing is impossible that you said. But I have to ask you, yes. uh, Meghan Markle. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's quite obvious that you're related to her, aren't you? Because you sound like her too. You think so? You know, I've, when I've did been you first that. become aware that you were the the exact copy of Meghan Markle, and are you enjoying the benefits of royalty? <laughs> um, so it started when she um, became casted in suits. You know, it would be people on the street. Oh, you know, who you look like what? especially when I have my hair out. People are like, you look now, suits exactly. Suits is a TV show she was in before she got married. Correct. Okay. It, it started at that point. People said, you look like the girl from Suits. And I had never watched Suits. I wasn't familiar. So I started watching a few episodes. And I said, OK, I can see some, some resemblances, you know. But I didn't feel that it was enough to be actually quantified as a lookalike. Yeah. And um, it just began ever since. And then she, when the Prince Harry 
dating started occurring right. and, and then the marriage, it just went into overdrive. <laughs> <laughs> well, Meghan Markle, oh, um, forgive me, <laughs> Krista Boyd, thank you so much for joining us on TPI. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. We have more for you after the break. Every time I will go into my room, I will call upon the ancestors. I was taught that I need to call the dead spirit or the river spirits. They are the ones who will then give me guidance. Your Turning Point experience doesn't have to end when the program is over. Follow us on your favorite social media. in our next story was on a search for spiritual guidance which led her to seek out her ancestors what was supposed to bring her peace and joy only turned out to bring her torment and fear here's her story my name is Mpo I grew up with my grandmother and I'm from a traditional background as well as Christian. So at home we'll practice traditional ceremonies and also go to church on Sunday. My father was an Inyanga, so since I was a little girl, I also used to have dreams and I will see mostly past relatives. I will then narrate it to my grandmother and she will explain that it's because I have a calling. It started to get rife when I was doing grade nine and then my mother took me to a doctor because I was sick. And then the doctor said, they can't see anything wrong with me. And then a friend of his invited over to a Nyanga for a reading and she went with me. And then the Nyanga confirmed that I was getting all these illnesses because I was called by an ancestor. The Nyanga said then we can appease the ancestors instead. So we made a Muketi, which is a ritual to appease ancestors and then they asked the ancestors on my behalf for them to wait for me until I finish my high school and I finish my uh, college. So I decided to then go again to consult to the same Inyanga and then she said this thing will continue to happen with me until I accept my calling as an Inyanga. So that's how we started the ritual of Ukutwaza, which is a process of you getting ready. They prepare you to be initiated and I remember the lady who was helping me, she prepared a bath for me, which is a sign of accepting that now I'm ready to be initiated and then they also gave me articles that I need to have at home as a practice so every time I will go into my room I will call upon the ancestors I was taught that I need to call the dead spirit or the river spirits they are the ones who will then give me guidance I was also required to go to the gravesite so I will take a candle with me and then burn umpepu and a, a traditional beer, which is umkumboti. So it was part of the ritual. I was fearful, especially because of the dreams that I will get. 
I will sometimes dream about my past relatives, especially my grandmother and my aunt. I was given a choice to choose between my ancestors and there was this gentleman also sitting down on my bed. And I remember when I looked at my grandmother and my aunt, there was this terrifying feeling about it and I couldn't choose them. For a reason, I managed to choose this calming spirit with this gentleman. He had the, you know, like a light, glorious robe. And then I will see also myself sometimes being drawn to a river and I will see myself walking towards and they will be right next to the river. And every time when I will get close enough to get into, I will wake up. I wouldn't have peace myself because sometimes I will find myself speaking to myself and people will be watching me. So I was also searching for God, but I didn't know how to get there until I listened to this preacher who made it clear that the only way to God is through Christ Jesus. Amazing as I was listening to him, he was teaching mostly about the things that I was doing, like consulting the dead and having your own high place, which is the thing that God doesn't want us to do. And I remember having this fear also in my heart that I really need to, you know, search the scriptures more and find out what is really there that I'm doing that God wasn't really happy about. So I remember accepting Christ Jesus after following a prayer that you need to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And then I prayed a prayer of salvation. I took all the articles of Okutwasa and then I took a shaver, also shaved my head and then I burned everything because I wanted to renounce the practice and it was like a new beginning for me. And when I accepted Christ, I managed to find, you know, my spiritual healing that I was longing for. As a person, I felt really liberated, like I was being taken out of prison. So now, instead of thinking what I used to think, I'm thinking what the Word of God is concerning my life. What do I need to do that is pleasing to God? And the Bible says it is only by faith that I can please God, not by works, not by rituals, not by calling ancestors or appeasing them or giving them sacrifices. It's only by, you know, following what the Word of God is saying that I can live a new life. I decided to accept the calling of God in my life. I went for a Bible school in East London and my husband and I, we preaching to the people, we go door to door, we sharing with the people about the love of God especially and the importance of accepting Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know, in this day and age, everybody wants power. Everyone is looking for a voice to direct them to tell them what the future holds. Let me encourage you not to go down the wrong route. Jesus came not only to bring you light, but to give you assurance of your future. You are secure in him. So I want to ask you to pray with me. If you've either gone to strange places to ask for cards to be read, or your palms have been read, or you've been taken somewhere where marks have been put on you, as some do in different parts of the world. Let me challenge you and ask you to ask Jesus into your life, to be your Lord, to be your Savior, to bring you into a new day and bring light. And then I'll pray for you. So say these words after me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I recognize that I need your help. I recognize that all the things I've dabbled in have only brought turmoil. But I believe you bring peace and you bring life abundantly. I confess that I'm a sinner and that you died for me and you rose again. Be my Lord and my Savior. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who prayed this prayer. Pray for those who have been 
dedicated in strange places. We ask that the power of your blood, Lord Jesus, will break every hold. I pray for my brothers and my sisters that are feeling the physical reaction to the things they've been through right now. We pronounce peace. We command it to be still. We pray they will know without doubt that you are God. Amen. Stay with us. We have more for you on TPI after this. Turning Point experience doesn't have to end when the program is over. Follow us on your favorite social media. back we've come to the end of the program but we are online 24 7 take time to comment on facebook or on instagram would love to hear from you from all of us here at tpi goodbye and god bless Never changing, never failing oh.